Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Bible study. Pray you got your Bibles, your notepads, your pens, your drink of choice as we are about to continue our journey through. We've gone through the tribulation and uh, now we're looking, we've looked at the 75 days after the tribulation. And now it's time to begin our study of really the millennial reign, Christ's kingdom, which follows that 75 days. And so all the preparations that have been taken care of for the kingdom to start, what, what has happened, the earth has been restored uh, to its beauty. The temple has been cleansed and rebuilt in, in a new and better way. The evil of the world is dealt with. Uh, and has been set aside for just a time, as, as we'll see as this study unfolds. Um, the citizens of the kingdom are present, and they're ready to receive their inheritance in that time. And who is that? Well, it's all the, the resurrected saints from the Old Testament, um, the church and the tribulation. They're all entering the kingdom at the same time. And, and as well as those believers who actually made it through the tribulation, who, who didn't die, and all living unbelievers, which are only Gentiles at this point, we know that they are sent to a place called Hades. So let's dive into this and we will learn about this kingdom uh, that is going to be there for you and I. And, and so we got to go to the book of Revelation. And actually, it's, it's interesting when we dive into this tonight, we'll begin to see that... Um, there's not much in the book of Revelation. Uh, we'll return to where we left off, but we'll, we'll see what we need to do to kind of piece this all together and how does it work. And so uh, why don't you turn with me to Revelations chapter 20, verse 6, and it says this. We'll read verse 6 and 7. It says, Blessed is the Holy One who has a part in the first resurrection over these, the second death, has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. So, in verse 6, we learn what happens before the kingdom begins, and, and in verse 7, we learn what happens after the kingdom ends so really, the book of Revelation, it actually tells us nothing about what happens in that thousand years of the kingdom. You think about it, the entire kingdom period takes place between verses 6 and 7 in the book of Revelation. Uh, the only thing that, that Revelation really tells us about the kingdom is the length of time, a thousand years. And the reason... Revelation virtually <laughs> ignores the details of the kingdom is because the rest of the Bible is literally filled with all the details that you need. Remember, we need to use Scripture to interpret Scripture, and if it's not in the book, we will find it mentioned elsewhere in the book. And so, and if you study the kingdom, the kingdom is described in really in the Torah. And it's a major theme of the Old Testament prophets and even in the Psalms. And Jesus offers some tantalizing details in a, in a lot of his parables and his other teachings. And even some of the epistles, uh, some of the writers, they give us a, a, a few details. So we actually have to venture outside of the book of Revelation for for our next two weeks to examine the life and the times of the kingdom, that thousand year reign. And so I think we need to uh, begin by remembering uh, what the term kingdom actually means in the Bible. And a lot of believers, Christians, followers operate, I think, with a very limited and superficial understanding of their own eternal future. And the concept of the kingdom or, or heaven is largely kind of limited to, let, let's call it like a, a hallmark theology, right? And as, that, as a result of that, uh, our understanding of all of this is largely void of substance and of actual meaning. And it's ironic 
that the Bible actually speaks really extensively about the coming kingdom using a variety of terms and descriptions, pictures, or, or, or shadows. In fact, the coming kingdom really is one of the most important themes of the Old Testament, second only to the Messiah, Jesus. And you could, man, if you were to go all the way from Genesis to, to Malachi in the Old Testament, you can find all of these references everywhere littered throughout the scriptures. And, and in the New Testament, discussions of the kingdom were they were incredibly important to Jesus's ministry. Did you know that there are 160 mentions of the kingdom in the New Testament? And actually 125 of them are found in the four gospels. Jesus, what did he do? He talked of entering the kingdom, of living in the kingdom, of ruling in the kingdom, and having an inheritance in the kingdom. You look at Paul, Paul also taught that we would receive our inheritance in the kingdom when Jesus returns. And now Revelation tells us that the kingdom is a thousand years long. So if we look at the Bible's teaching about the kingdom across all of these references, we, we find the concept of the kingdom actually progressing. The kingdom concept transitions through four stages of meaning from the Old Testament to the, to the New Testament. And I think it's important to recognize these transitions. Um, we got to recognize the transition points to arrive at really the proper interpretation. We don't want to just be kind of tossed to and fro or chase down wild goose tails, right? We, we need to understand the transition points. And and the kingdom theme, it actually begins in Genesis when, when you study it as a promise, something God would correct because of the sin of Adam. Uh, the, the promise is it's clearly articulated in the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants, right? The nation of Israel, what, what's going to happen? They would enjoy an inheritance of a land and, and posterity of descendants, a, a perfect king and an unending peace. And... Uh, Many generations of believers in Israel, they actually look forward to the future fulfillment of that promise. Hebrews 11 verse 13, all these died in faith, right? Without receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Then the time came to fulfill that promise, and the Lord came to Israel offering the kingdom in that day. What happened? Jesus made Israel a proposal. Accept me as your king, and I will give you the promised kingdom. We all know what happened. Israel rejected their king, and, uh, and as a result, Jesus withdrew his proposal, and the kingdom was taken from that generation of Israel. And in their place, the kingdom proposal was given to the Gentiles who became the bride of Christ instead of Israel. So the proposal of the kingdom was temporarily withdrawn and in its place emerged a recruiting of the Gentiles to actually join the kingdom. And, and this program advanced the call to believe in Jesus. And as a person obeys the call, what happens? They become a part of the spiritual kingdom. They become citizens of a heavenly kingdom that is not of this world. And, and this program, it's going to continue until the Lord puts an end to it by calling his bride to heaven at the resurrection. And, and we have studied uh, the Lord will return to earth a second time. And at that point, the kingdom is going to appear as promised. It's at that point, the kingdom will become a literal place, just as God promised to Abraham and his descendants. It will, it will exist on earth in the future, and it will also include men and women from, from all nations it is also a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham when God said all nations are going to be what? Are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. 
So really the, the concept of a kingdom progresses from a really a promise to a proposal to a program and finally to a place it exists here it is and and at the point we've reached in revelation we we have seen the program come to an end at the rapture right and now we see the kingdom begin at christ's second coming and in this time to come all the good things the lord has promised to his people they're finally going to be fulfilled and and we wait for the kingdom to see his promises fulfilled because the promises were always set in that time not in this one so it's time for you and i to learn about that place a very real world that will that you and i will actually inhabit for 1000 years and uh, we'll enjoy that time in a home we call ours, right? With a land and possessions that can never be taken away. We'll be absent disease and sorrow. Um, there's going to be nothing in the world to disturb our peace and our joy. We're actually going to have meaningful work that is not hard. And, and we're going to have relationships and, and this natural beauty to enjoy. And uh, we will know worship and serve the Lord in ways that we can't even imagine today. Can't tell you exactly what the earth and seas look like after the rest restoration process it goes through. Uh, but I think one thing for sure, uh, the world of the kingdom, it's not going to be less of a place to enjoy than the world we know now, right? The beauty and the, the suitability of the kingdom earth it's not going to be less than the beauty and enjoyment in the world today. It's going to be far greater, right? Definitely going to be far greater. And while there, there is much that, you know what, speculation and all that, there's much we can't know about that place. There is some stuff we can know. There is some stuff we can learn. And our goal really in this study is to learn what we can in a short time. So your understanding, so my understanding of that time is gonna grow, right? It's not gonna be something, well, I don't quite get it. No, our understanding is going to grow. And as we come to understand more about what life in that place will be like, I think we can actually look forward to it even more because there's more of an understanding. And as you think more about kingdom life you will begin to live more for that life rather for this one right we have to have eternity stamped in our mindsets and because there is a lot we we could say about the kingdom i i think we need to approach this section of the study and, and we'll break it down into sections and and so first, we're, we'll, we'll study the changes in order of creation and in nature, including really geography borders, well, including geography borders uh, and government of the land. Then we'll move into studying the people of the kingdom and the quality of daily life in that time. Thirdly, we'll, we'll, we'll study Jesus's place in the kingdom, including the nature of worship really in the new kingdom temple and then finally we will study the culminating event of the kingdom that war of gog and 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 magog right so as we do this let's start with the way creation changes during the kingdom period uh and to do that we actually have to look at the past right so where do we go we go all the way back to when adam and and eve when they sinned and the Lord responded to their sin with a series of pronouncements, right? We see that in Genesis 3, 17 and to, to verse 19. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
So what happens? The Lord responds to Adam's willful, and remember, it was willful sin by doing what? By cursing the ground or the earth itself. God placed the whole earth under a curse, and the curse from God, what is it? It's a pronouncement of judgment resulting really in destruction. So the earth is going to one day be destroyed and replaced, and we'll get to that later on in the study. But in the meantime, the nature of creation, it also changed, right? Starting with the need for mankind to do what? To toil, to produce food from the ground. The Lord, he declared that the earth would produce thorns and thistles naturally. So apart from the toil of man, uh, the earth, it's, it's going to produce weeds and really some unhelpful plants. And you see that if you get into garden today, you experience that for yourself. And it's only by the sweat of his brow would man be able to produce the food that he required. Because what happened before the curse, man enjoyed life in the garden that produced all the food he required without any work at all. No weed came up, no unhelpful plants to crowd out the good ones. What happened? Adam only needed to walk outside his door and he found everything, all the food that he, he wanted. And furthermore, the days of man will be numbered, meaning life would have an end called death, right? There was this thing that was going to happen, death. And the spirit of Adam died in the moment he ate the fruit, and, and now his physical body would also die. Everything that came from the ground was, was cursed, like the ground itself, which meant the physical body of man was to die. Likewise, the animal kingdom, which also was made from the earth, would also die. And the Lord instituted a process of decay that results in physical bodies succumbing to disease and frailty over time. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a result of sin. Death may also come from really instantaneous acts of violence, which are themselves a result of sin. And all of this is going to change uh, from the beginning because the physical body was created to live forever. Without sin, Paul explains in Romans, there would be no death either for us or for any other creature. So after the fall, the order of creation, it changed in in fundamental ways to include difficulty working the land and the death of the body. Then later, following the flood that, that we see, uh, the Lord made more changes to creation, specifically the animal kingdom. And we see that in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 Genesis chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3. And God blessed no one, his son said to them, what do you say? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear you have and the terror you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give it all to you as I gave the green plant. So what's happening in this moment here, and, and all the meat eaters are going to celebrate, the Lord gave mankind permission to eat animal uh, after the flood, right? Prior to that moment, human, humans, what we really ate was plants, as God directed in the garden. And though the text, it doesn't mention the animal's diet changing, we assume that animals began to eat each other, Two after this time. So this change, it would have been necessary at the time since in the days and in, in weeks after the flood, vegetation, it would have been sparse, right? There would have been not much growing. So without meat to eat, animals would, would have really starved. And likewise, a change in the earth's climate following the flood made it more difficult to grow cops, crops, not cops. <laughs> uh, then to protect animals from a quick extinction, the Lord, he actually leveled the playing field by placing the fear of man into animals. Because the animals were, they were previously unafraid of men and, and each other, but now this predatory prey relationship 
it was established. Animals were adversaries with each other and man with animals. Animals might actually attack men and men might eat animals. So the world, the world we know where people and animals eat one another, attack one another, and ultimately die represents a change to creation's original intent. And I think likewise, it's the difficulty with which we work with nature, I think is also a change to the original plan of God. And these things, they were brought about as a result of the original sin, man's sin. And in the future, right, the Lord has a plan to correct uh, for all of these consequences of Adam's sin, but he does it in stages. So during the kingdom, he begins the correction process and he completes it in the new heavens and the new earth that actually follow the kingdom. Let me just take a sip. This one, if you've ever wondered, is there animals in heaven? Well, Isaiah 11, verses 6 and 7. And wolf will dwell with the lamb, uh, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One of the first comforting things that we can learn about the created order of the kingdom is that animals exist in this time as well. And how many ever heard, hey, is my pet going to be in heaven with me? Is, is my doggy going to be there? Is my kitty cat? Is my hamster? Is my gerbil going to be there? Um, well, maybe, maybe your, your, your pet might be there, but definitely not cats, right? There's no cats in heaven. No, I can't prove that scripturally, so let's not quote that. But uh, they go to another place, right? <laughs> Whenever we answer a question about heaven, we always need to be specific about the place and time that we actually mean. Heaven isn't a single place or time because heaven really is where Jesus is. That's what heaven is. And as Jesus moves around, and, and therefore, um, so do we, right? Heaven for us begins in the throne room of God after death or the rapture. And that's going to be our home for a short time. But it's not our permanent home because it's not a physical place to dwell. Uh, we are made to live on a physical earth, and so are animals. But since animals, they don't have a soul, they won't be found in the temporary home that we have in the heavenly throne room, right? But when Jesus brings us back to earth for the kingdom, Isaiah says we're going to find animals on the earth during the kingdom. But according to Isaiah chapter 11, the nature of the animal kingdom, it's changed, right? Predators like wolves, leopards, and lions will live peacefully next to prey like lambs, goats, and calves. And, and even more interesting, large, dangerous animals, they're not going to pose any threat to people. And animals are actually not going to show any fear of man. Even a cobra poses no risk to a small child, we see. And a, and a young boy can command the obedience of any animal. And being without really a reason to fear man, these animals, these animals are going to cease attacking men with these kind of lethal defense mechanisms. In short, you can look at it as all animals are going to be domesticated and, and now will obey the will of man. And will once again, man will have dominion over the animal kingdom the way that it was supposed to be way back in the garden. Today, many wild animals, they simply can't be domesticated. You ever see people that try to take wild animals for pets and they change and they go crazy? Yeah, because it doesn't happen. They're always going to revert to their wild instincts. But in this day, the Lord removes that predator-prey relationship. So there's no, going, no longer going to be the hunted and the hunters, right? And this is really a direct reversal of, of the pronouncement God gave Noah 
And it's a step back to the nature of the world as it was when it started. And so next, the Lord reverses the curse of toiling to produce food in kingdom life. And in speaking about what Israel will experience in the kingdom, the Lord actually says life gets easy. How many say I'm in? I'm in for some some easy life. And what is it? Ezekiel uh, 34 verses 25 to 27. And I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and places around my hill a blessing and I will cause showers to come down in their seasons. Uh, they will be showers of blessings. Also the tree of the field will yield its fruit and the earth will yield its increase and they will be secure on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who have enslaved them. So the Lord establishes a covenant of peace with Israel, and that covenant establishes the nation in their land once more. And in the place that the Lord makes, his, makes the hills of Israel, he makes them a blessing again. And he says they can sleep in the, in the woods securely without fear, which is a way of indicating that they actually have no enemies, neither men nor beasts. No enemies. Total peace. But then notice that the tree of the field will yield fruit and the earth will yield increased. What are these terms to? Well, these terms are referring to the natu natural production of the earth without the need to farm or cultivate the land. And again, that is a direct reversal of the curse on the earth that made life hard and difficult. Now the curse has been lifted so that working in a field really isn't work anymore. And this is true both for Israel and all the nations of the earth. So when we hear that we are given an inheritance in the land and our life will be one of farming, you... You need to understand what that means. It's not a hard life. It's the actual opposite. Farming is a joy when the land is giving you its produce without the need to prepare the land or even sow the seed, right? Check out what it says in Ezekiel chapter 36. In verses 27 uh, to 30, then we'll read 35 to 36. 34 to 36. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so they will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply it. I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply, multiply the fruit of the tree and, and, and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Verse 34, the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. Uh, I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. The Lord says... The land is actually going to be like Eden again. And there's never, ever going to be famine in the land again. He's going to call for the fruit and grain to come forth for the people. And uh, you think about how hard it will be to farm a land producing food at, at the call of God's voice, right? I think that's also an incredible picture of God's grace. The Lord does the work, and what happens? We receive the blessing. But how does God ensure so much success when it comes to farming in the desert? And when, when you go to Israel, or if you get to go to Israel, and we do have a trip scheduled for uh, April 2023, the 17th through the 27th, you begin to see, man, it is, it's a desert, right? It is this desert place in, in some of the areas that you're in. 
But how does God ensure so much success when it comes to farming in a desert? Well, let's read that. What does it say? What does the scripture say? Isaiah chapter 30, verses 23 to 26. Then he will give you rain for seed, which you will, you will sow in the ground, and bread from the yield of the ground, and it will be rich and plenteous. On the day your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture. Also the oxen and the donkeys, which fork, uh, which work the ground, will eat salted fodder, which has been uh, winnowed with a shovel and a fork. On every lofty mountain and on every high hill, uh, there will be streams running with water. And on the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be seven times brighter like the light of the seven days. Uh, on the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the bruise he has inflicted. What's it saying? After the Lord rescues Israel... He gives it good things, right? He, he, the good things he promised in the kingdom, where before they, they actually suffered uh, during the time of tribulation, um, now they're going to have everything they need. They get rain and, and rich, roomy pastures for cattle with plenty of feed. And when we hear of the geography of Israel, it's actually very different than it is today. Streams running everywhere on the tops of mountain, rains falling wherever they, they plant. I, I think even more curious is the moon and the sun see their brightness increase dramatically. Now, it's not clear whether Isaiah means this literally or whether it's simply a, a, a literary device indicating the optimistic and, and joyful perspective of Israel. That is, that in the day the sun will seem brighter, but, but if it is literal, it brings kind of more questions to answer, doesn't it? How can we survive on a planet with so much light? I think when it comes to we can trust that God has a way to accommodate these changes, right, and still produce a, an incredible, wonderful world for you and I to live in. And it, probably everyone's going to have a fabulous tan, right? No burns, <laughs> so the creation in the kingdom, it's actually going to be closer to the time of Eden with animals obeying man, not predators killing one another, and the land beginning to produce so easily. But one thing is not going to change, though. The curse on Satan and the serpent is going to continue through the kingdom period. Because back in Genesis 3, the Lord also placed a curse on on Satan for his part in the fall. What did he say? If you remember Genesis 3, 14, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So the serpent was a, call it a literal snake indwelled by Satan who took the snake uh, as a disguise to deceive the woman. And as a result at the moment, the Lord cursed the snake in verse 14. The snake was made to give up its legs and crawl on the ground. What does that tell us? That, that prior to the fall, that we can see that snake stood upright and or at least... Uh, its belly didn't touch the ground. But from this point forward, the snake would be against the ground to remind men of their eventual destination, the earth, right? And obviously the, the snake was an, an unwitting participant in that moment and not to be blamed for the outcome. So the Lord's curse against the snake wasn't intended as a punishment against the animal. Instead, it was a memorial to remind mankind of the moment of their true adversary, right? So for as long as Satan remains and for as long as sin is still part of life on earth, the snake would assume this form. So does this curse get reversed for the kingdom period? No, no, it doesn't. We, we don't see that. Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. 
So in the kingdom, Isaiah says, the snake continues to eat dust, which is a direct reference all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. In other words, the snake's curse from uh, continues, his, his curse continues unchanged during the kingdom, the thousand year reign. His form isn't changing because the conditions that led to his new form haven't been reversed. Satan is still around, though he's bound until the end of the thousand years, the kingdom. So we've looked at some changes. Let's consider other changes to the borders and geography that takes place during the renewing of the heavens and the earth. First, Israel will exist in the kingdom, but Israel's borders, they're going to be different than they are today or at any time in the past. What happens? God establishes new borders for Israel, which while eliminating the historical enemies of Israel that surrounded um, Israel. Today, Israel occupies, man, it's, it's a tiny slice of land right up against the Mediterranean Sea. You got Lebanon on the north and you got Egypt on the south and you have Jordan and Syria on the east. Um, and this territory that we see there is really only a fraction of what the nation once possessed at the height of the kingdom under Solomon. Um, at that time, Israel, they were the dominant kingdom on, on earth. They were the superpower of its day. And really, kind of at its pinnacle, Israel reached well north into Syria, including all of Lebanon and the land east of the Jordan, and it stretched southward uh, into Egypt and in, in southern uh, Jordan. Israel has never since controlled so much territory, and we might expect that God would give Israel a grant of land similar to the land that they held under David and Solomon, uh, but that's not the half of it, literally. So let's look back at the land God promised to Abraham and his descendants in his covenant, in the Abrahamic covenant, right? Genesis 15, 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So God gives Israel's borders from the river of Egypt to the river uh, Euphrates. And the river of Egypt is at the historic border of Israel in Egypt on the Sinai Peninsula. And the Euphrates River is actually in Iraq, which is far east of any historical borders that had been given to Israel. And later when Israel moved into the promised land under Joshua, the Lord reiterated the borders of the land he was given to Israel. Joshua 1 verses 2, 3, and 4. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as to the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun, will be your territory. So the Lord elaborates on his grant of land, saying he gave Israel the land from the wilderness to Lebanon. And from the great river Euphrates to the great sea, these descriptions extend far beyond the traditional borders of Israel. Uh, these, these borders uh, that God has promised will be... Uh, they're going to be Israel in that day. He fulfills the promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to Israel. And Ezekiel actually gives us a few, a few more markers. In Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 15 to 20, uh, and if we plot these geographical markers, we actually arrive at a much different Israel. It will be... Uh, occupy a far larger area of the land than anything seen before. And I think more importantly, God's promise for Israel to rule over their captors, it's actually fulfilled by these borders. Israel will consume all the nations that historically persecuted 
Israel in this region. Moad, Ammon, Edom, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and the others as God promised. Isaiah 14, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel, and I settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take uh, them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord as male servants and female servants, and uh, they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. What's it say in Isaiah 54, verse 3? For you will spread abroad the right, uh, to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess the nations, and you will resettle the desolate cities. So Israel is going to be much larger than it's ever been, and it's going to actually consume its neighbors. We don't actually have borders for the, for the Gentile nations, except that the Bible, it really does note that many familiar nations will be represented. And, and really, we don't have the time to explore uh, that area in detail. But maybe one time when we dive into maybe the book of Ezekiel, we can, uh, we can look at it a little bit closer. But in summary, many nations are going to be repopulated around the earth with the Gentile believers, uh, though there are a few exceptions. Edom will exist in the kingdom, but it's going to remain empty as a memorial to their sin against Israel. It actually is going to be the location of the entry to the pit where actually Satan is being held, where he is bound for a thousand years. And, and smoke is going to pour out of the pit and, and no human being uh, is, will set foot on this land. Not going to happen. Uh, secondly, Egypt is going to exist, but the Egyptians of the kingdom will not be allowed to enter their land for the first 40 years of the kingdom. Why? This is a memorial to the way that the, to the way Egypt stumbled Israel with idols, leading to Israel's time of wandering in the desert for how long? Forty years. But eventually Egypt will be allowed to be inhabited after the 40 years are up. And, and those are the major geographical and, and boundary changes of the kingdom but there are also natural changes to the land in the kingdom that we see. In addition to, to land being more fruitful and with more rivers, there, there's going to be a, a, some more geographical changes, starting with the mountain on which Jerusalem sits, Micah 4.1. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established and the chief of the mountains, it will be raised uh, above the hills and the people will stream to it this mountain will be raised up high and it's going to draw people towards it from all around the world uh, and the mountain at the center of israel will become the tallest mountain in the world and on the top of the mountain is going to sit the temple the house of the lord where christ dwells and and we'll actually study that a little bit more as we wind down the study of, uh, of Revelation. Next, Zechariah says something very interesting. There will be new rivers, new rivers flowing from the top of this mountain. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 8, 9, and 10. And in, the day, in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. And it will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. And the Lord will be the only one in his name, the only one. And all the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place from the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. Verse 11, people will live in it and there will no longer be curse for Jerusalem will, Jerusalem will dwell in security. So the city of Jerusalem will become the source for two rivers, one that's going to flow east and the other one that's going to flow west. The one that flows west is going to end up in the Mediterranean Sea, while the one that flows east is going to end up in the Dead Sea. And fascinating, 
uh, when, when you begin to study Ezekiel and the, and the prophecy that Ezekiel speaks of, of that this is going to have a dramatic impact on the Dead Sea. Ezekiel 47. I want you to listen to it. Remember, it's the Dead Sea. Then he said to me, these waters go out towards the eastern region and go down into the Arabah, and then they go towards the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live, and there will be very many fish, for these waters go there, and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that the fishermen will stand beside it from Engedi to Engliam, and there will be a place for the spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea, very many. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. So what is happening here, the river flowing from Mount Zion will transform the Dead Sea into a fresh body of water. And Ezekiel, he doesn't say if this happens miraculously, instantaneously, or does it happen naturally over a time as fresh water as it begins to dilute the sea. With the sense of the text saying that this is a miraculous change, especially when you begin to consider that the lake becomes filled with every kind of fish. So the Dead Sea comes to life as a beautiful millennial picture of God's grace beginning by, by actually bringing life to the dead. And it's when, the last time when we were in Israel, they were actually for a season actually selling fisher uh, fishing licenses for for the Dead Sea because they they know that this is this is going to be the case and so it was just kind of fascinating you could have bought a fishing license for for the Dead Sea because here Ezekiel adds that fishermen will fish there from Engedi which is in the the south near Masada to Engliam which is kind of unknown but probably somewhere in the north and they will fish according to their kinds, meaning that there, there will be so much variety uh, of fish that fishermen were actually going to specialize in their catch and that the fish are going to be bountiful. But there's going to be the salt marshes that remain probably as a testimony of how the Lord changed water from salt to fresh. And Zechariah 14 actually gives us a few additional interesting details about the land. Seasons will continue as they do today, so life will continue to have rhythm like we know it today. And Zechariah says that the land around Jerusalem will be transformed to, into a large flat plain extending for miles. And we will actually learn more about how this plain is used as a little bit later in the book of Revelation. But finally, on top of the mountain will sit the temple and the seat of the government for the entire kingdom period. Micah 4, 2, many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob and, to the, and that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. And from Zion will go forth the law and even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The nations of the world wherever they are settled, will make their way to Jerusalem and learn about the God of Israel. And the laws of the world will come from Zion, from the word of the Lord. And so the capital on earth at the time during this millennial uh, thousand years is going to be Jerusalem, where the Lord dwells, ruling the nations. And uh, again, we'll get into that a little bit later in Revelations. But in Micah verse 3, uh, says the Lord renders a decision between the nations, including the mighty and distant nations. And, and to rule over people implies that they need ruling in order to do the right things, right? And that's a sign that sin is present. And therefore, the world needs Christ's perfect judgment to ensure proper behavior. But Christ rules with such perfection that, that he can control sin even on the opposite side of the earth. Fascinating. 
Christ exerts his perfect rule through government that does his bidding perfectly. Isaiah says that his government officials will know his will instantly and will do it always. Not like politicians that talk today, right? Hey, I promise you this. Isaiah 65, 24, it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. His government will ensure that no sin gets room to grow or is going to take peace from the earth. In fact, Michael says that says that implements of, of war were they're going to be done away with. And in the art of war, it's going to be forgotten altogether. Micah chapter 4, verse 3, And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will, there, will they train for war. So while sin exists, it will have no material impact on life since it will be under the perfect rule at all times. And actually Psalm 2 describes the Lord's rule this way. Uh, Psalm 2, verses 6 to 9. Uh, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like uh, earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show uh, discernment, take in warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. The Lord, he, he will break or, or rule them with a rod of iron. He shatters the resistance of sinful nations like pottery, right? But also, you need to notice that there are kings and judges of the earth uh, in that day who Micah says should show discernment in ruling. So, so this means their government under Jesus's government that rules with Jesus under his authority. And the government carries out his orders perfectly to ensure sin is ruled perfectly. Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born unto us, a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this saying the government is going to sit on his shoulders, meaning Jesus, he actually presides over a new kind of bureaucracy, right? Um, the world is a big place and, and there will be many to rule over. So what does Jesus do? He enlists others in his government, including us. And the government is divided into a Jewish government and a Gentile government. Israel, the nation that saw so many rule over in the past, will now rule over the world. And their most famous king is actually going to return to rule over them as their prince serving under the authority of Jesus. Jeremiah 30 verses 8 and 9. It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and will tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them. Then in Ezekiel 34, uh, verses 23 to 24, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and, and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So David is resurrected and returns to rule over the land of Israel under Christ's government. And he is called prince because Jesus is king. 
And under David, we find 12 tribes of Israel ruled by the apostles as Jesus promised. If you remember Matthew 19, 28, and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne and uh, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 apostles will rule over the tribes of Israel as Jesus promised. The tribes of Israel will exist in the land and have additional rulers over them. And we can assume that these additional rulers will be other great Old Testament saints kind of rewarded with positions of honor for their service. But moving to the Gentiles, we find a little less detail, though we can learn a couple things, right? First, the Gentile nations are, are spread around the world and will have a need of government representation as well. And you and I will fill that need. The church saints will rule them. And we saw this already in Revelations chapter 20 when we heard that the church saints will rule with Christ. That was in verse 4. We looked at it last week. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony, and Jesus because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Also, Jesus taught parables, really emphasizing he will reward those who are faithful here and now with the opportunity to be faithful with more. Uh, the parable of the talents in Luke 19, really Jesus rewarded spiritual maturity with an opportunity to rule and reign with over, over cities, right? This parable pictures the way that, that Jesus will assign us roles in the kingdom government. And you may say... I don't care whether you have a high position in the kingdom of government, but, but Jesus holds it out as a desirable reward. So we should aspire to please him now and in the kingdom as well as uh, Paul actually says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can read that. And I think finally we need to understand that all the nations are not created equal in this age. Israel is going to be the highest nation on earth. And all other nations, they're actually going to serve Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commands, which I commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord, as male servants and female servants, and they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. The Gentiles, they will serve Israel, and the Lord will set Israel above all other nations in honor and actually in position. And this is really a complete reversal of Israel's historical position ever since the Lord began to discipline the nation because of their sin. Now they actually receive their blessing under God's promise. And it's, I think it's, it's worth a moment to remember how Israel actually arrived at this point of glory. They were created as a nation by God through Abraham, received promises, they actually entered into a national covenant to obtain God's blessing. What happened? They violated the old covenant. And so they spent many long years as people under God's judgment. They were dispersed and then they suffered great losses. And ultimately, they endured the tribulation where God brought them to their end. And in the end, they came to faith and received their Messiah. And he will save them and bring them into the promised blessings of the covenant and make them obey God's law perfectly. And he will make them the chief nation of the earth. And, and really all of this need for government and ruling suggests that there is going to be disobedience in that time. And that disobedience, what does that imply? It implies sin. So the question we need to raise is how... And why will sin exist in the kingdom? And that's an answer for next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's amazing. 
Thank you, God, that uh, we're learning and we're growing and, and we're getting an understanding of what it's going to be like in, in ruling and reigning with you in the millennium that thousand years after the tribulation. God, I pray your word continues to come alive in our heart. We're just so thankful for what you're doing and continue to give us revelation and wisdom, God, um, to make wise choices and to continue to be a mouthpiece to point everybody to you. You're amazing. We love you and we give you glory in your wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Well, bless you guys. We'll see you uh, tomorrow night at Bikers Church. Uh, Hillbilly is sharing his story tomorrow and Sunday. So if you got somebody that's struggling with a life of addiction, I'm telling you, man, this is the story they need to hear, a story of redemption, real life right in front of our eyes. Bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.